Hi, we're going to be learning the top ten teachings of Bracha Stav 58. We're going to do for the first five of the ten. Number one is the Bracha that we make when we encounter 600,000 Jewish people in the land of Israel. Number two is the story of, of Ben Zoma thanking God for all the good work that people do, food, clothing, business, and how to be a grateful guest. Number three is a blessing on a wise person, Jew or non-Jew, uh, or a king, Jew or non-Jew, and what the differences are. Number four is the story of Rab Sheshes, who was blind, but could hear on a different level than people who could see. And number five is the idea of God and his earthly counterpart, as well as a story with Rabbi Sheila. Okay, so without any further ado, let's get started. Number one is the blessing for 600,000 Jews, the Gemara and Brachas, 58a, or uh, 58.1, I should say, the Ahmed Aleph, says the following. In the name of Rabbi Hamnuna, if you see a luchse Yisrael, that's, that's a multitude which will later be defined as 600,000, we make a blessing, the standard text of a blessing starts with Baruch HaTashem Elokeinu Melech Olam, blessed are you, and so on, God, and then it continues and says the unique text for this specific occasion is Chacham Harazim, which means the wise of the that which is hidden or the secrets. Now, Abraisa just confirms that and gives the reasoning behind that. And it says the reason is She'ein Da'atam Dim Domezelazad. They're they're their minds, their intellect, are not similar to one another. And their facial features are not similar to one another. And the Gemara continues a little while later in the name of Ula and says, this is not in Babel. In Babylonia, if you see a huge gathering, you don't say this blessing. And also it's got to be 600,000. There's a few questions. The obvious question is, it's, it's a very impressive I don't know if this has ever happened in my lifetime, but why wouldn't you say this in Babel? That's one question, the obvious question. The second question is, if there was such a momentous thing that happened, the thing that I would think in my humble understanding is it's reminiscent of Yotze Mitzrayim, those who left Egypt, which were 600,000 and, and 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 more because the women, children, younger and older, uh, below and twenty and, and above sixty. But it was the six hundred thousand is how we describe the Yotze Mitzrayim or Matan Torah, the, the Torah being given. So I would identify this with either Exodus, Torah, or a representation of of all of Klal Yisrael, even if it isn't literally all of the collective of Israel, but it's enough to represent Klal Yisrael. So one of those three things. And and not only do we not do that, we say something like, blessed is the one who's who's wise enough to know the secrets. Why why is that? Because they there's a, all of these people, they don't think alike, they don't look alike. And I know there's a whole discussion lately. Every scholar wants to say, what, are, what is a Jew? And comes up with some like weird stupidity of, of you know, just to publish a book. Um, well, here's, here's what a Jew is. A Jew is somebody who doesn't have to be like the other Jew. They don't look the same. They don't even think the same, and they're still Jewish. That's why we make this blessing. We don't make the blessing on on Exodus, or even the Torah being given, or even is, or or even the idea that we have a nation. The the nation is in front of you. That's obvious. There's six hundred thousand people. That is a nation. That's that's a, that's a group of people that's significant enough to be considered a nation. The fact to answer the question why in Israel, because it's a nation that did have a homeland. So it's not just faith alone. Because it's not just a religion. It's there's a people with a nation. So there's people. There's a nation. And you want to know more about it? Ah, oh, that's the secret. That's the secret of being a Jew. Stop writing your, your stupid books about it. Nobody's interested in your stupidity, all these stupid professors writing real stupidity. I've never seen such brilliant people write such stupid things. Um, but anyway, th- that's the secret. Every All of these people, they don't think the same. Why are they a people? They are people. They are people. We know there are people. 
There are people. That's why God can testify that he understands them all. And there are people, precisely a type of people that are different. They don't have to all be the same. But they're still a people. That's the reality. Okay. Um, so we're celebrating diversity within a group. We're celebrating uniqueness within a group. And we're celebrating a God that relates to each one of them on their level. And that's a beautiful thing about Judaism. Okay, Mazel Tov. Number two, um, Ben Zoma. It's a continuation of number one because Ben Zoma was standing. Who is Ben Zoma? Is one of the four sages who went into the Pardes. And uh, in the Pardes, he, he had a negative reaction. Something went wrong with him. In, in his mental abilities, it's not clear exactly what that means. Different people have suggested different things. But he still seemed to be a brilliant scholar both before and after the incident and, and had uh, always something very interesting and erudite to say. He was one of the people who constantly um, studied and, and was diligent and, and, and insightful and wise, amongst other things. So listen to this. And he, for example, he's the one who says who is wealthy, who's happy with his lot, who's, who's, um, who's strong, who overcomes his, his uh, evil inclination, like things like that are the famous saying we say in the Haggadah that uh, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Azari said, I'm like 70 and I wanted to prove that we have to mention the Exodus on night and I didn't know how to prove it until Ben Zoma analyze the text and says kol yimei chayecha, the extra word kol comes to include the nights as well the days, so Benzoma is a very interesting and colorful character in the Talmud and he says the following thing he sees all of these Jews gathered, supposedly the 600,000 at the uh, Temple Mount and he makes the this bracha that we just mentioned before, the, the, this chacham harazim it's called, the wise, the wise knower of the secrets and then he adds on to the bracha, he says his own nusach, his own composition, which is Baruch Shabar Ela L'Sham Sheni Blessed are all these who have been uh, created to serve me. Now, it, it's brought down in co the commentators that that would fit in with what the Rambam says in Mar Nevuchim, that the purpose of the regular people is to take care of an elevated person, the philosopher, the Rambam, Benzoma, but that's not really the meaning if you look carefully at the next thing Benzoma continues and says. He used to say, how different am I from Adam, the beginning of, of creation of Adam, where what did Adam have to do to find bread or to find clothing, we start with the bread, he would plow, he would sow, he would reap, he would harvest and gather and thresh and winnow and, and, and select and grind and sift and knead and, and, and bake. And then after all of those things, that was a process that would take a year or whatever it is, many, many very difficult things and times to do. And that was all the things he had to do pretty much on his own, a little assist from Eve, but, but other than that, it was a lonely uh, two of them working on all of these things. And I, I get up in the morning and it's all, it's all ready. The bakery is delivering. And the same thing with Adam until he had to have clothing. He sheared, he cleaned and disentangled and, and spun and wove and, and did all of these things. To, to I, on the other hand, I get up in the morning, it's there. The, the, either it's in my closet, there's a tailor there ready to make me custom-made suit. And... Um, not only that, there's there's every nationality with every every particular quality that they have. They come, they're, they're at my doorstep, willing to sell me whatever it is that I'm looking for and I need. And what we see from here, it's another level, another quality. Usually, people think you're making a bracha. There's only one thing, which is true. There's only one thing, God. But the truth is, God made many things. He made people, Jews and non-Jews alike. And in that sense, you need to have hakara tatov. Some of the blessing includes not just blessing the source of all, which is God, but also the manifestations of creativity of the human beings and the human experience that those people, because of them, they provide these things for me. Yes, 
they might cost something, but they're still doing it for me. So it's actually the uh, almost the opposite of the simple the, the reading uh, trying to read Maimonides into this, is it's a celebration of yes, they actually did something for me. I appreciate all of, they didn't do it for themselves. They did it for me. Now if you're if you think that's you know that might be like that might not be like that. Listen to the next thing he says. What does a good uh, a good guest say about his host? He says, how wonderful that the host did all of these things for my sake. All of the meat that he bought, all the cuts of meat, and all the bottles of wine that he brought out before me, and all the wonderful pastries that he got, and all of the different things. Well, how much work did he have to do? And remember, each of the things that he, he purchased, what were all the backstories of the things that went into those things to be able to be sold by the various vendors who did sell them? A lot, right? And... I'm so grateful for this. So in other words, he wanted to really bring out all the things that were done for him, not for the people doing it for themselves. On the contrary, other people who are not grateful, he actually says, would say, what did the, what did the host really do for me? He did everything. He gave me one little piece. So he made, this, he made the meat, he made the brisket for him and his family. He got the wine for him and his family. He didn't do it for me. I just happened to be there. I, 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 I came along for the ride, but he would have gone without me and done all of these things. So in other words, in life, do we just say that the people have to do what they have to do? They would do it for somebody else. Or do you look at it like they're doing it for you and, you, and, you're, and, and you're so grateful that they're doing it for you? So it's pretty clear from the second and third statement, especially the third statement about the guests of how Ben Zoma views things. Now... Um, that's a, a very important way to be grateful and very important that, that when we make a bracha we make two types of brachot one type of bracha is just to thank God the other type of bracha is really to be thankful for the, um, the great things that people are providing for us number three is the special blessing we make for wise people and for kings. So the Gemara says the following thing. If you see a Jewish sage, you say, You say, blessed is the one, you know, the same thing, Melech uh, Olam, the king of the universe, that has, has given a, a portion of his wisdom to those who are in awe of him. As opposed to seeing a, a wise person amongst the nations, you say the same introduction to the bracha, but you say, Shinasan, instead of a the portion he gave, Mechachmato the Biotav, his wisdom to his creatures. So there's obviously two differences, Chalak versus Natan, a portion versus giving. By the way, a lot of times in the Torah, they are almost interchangeable, the idea of Chalak and Natan, but other times they have significant implications and unique meanings. And we could read a lot into it as much as we want to. For example, we say, uh, um, that that um, God's people are like they're a portion. They're like a, like there's a, almost like a physical relationship, a, a part. Like you, a chelik means you get a, a piece of something. So, okay. Um, if you see a Malchi Yisrael, if you see a Jewish king, you say, again, Chalak Mechvod Alireyav. The introduction is the same as all the Brachot, and he gave a portion from his honor to those who are in awe of him. And if you see a king of the nations of the world, you say, you say, Blessed is the one who gave from his kavod, from his honor or glory to his creatures. And Rabbi Yochanan is, is quoted as saying, a person should always make an effort to go and to run after seeing a king, and not just a Jewish king, even a non-Jewish king, because if you'll merit, you'll see the difference between Machi Yisrael and Machi Ovdu Kachavim. A Jewish king, and a lot of the commentaries say it's talking about, you know, by the time of Yochanan, uh, Rabbi Yochanan, there was no Jewish king, he is referring to the future Jewish king, to the Mashiach, and a and a regular king. Just a couple things about a king. Um, what's the idea of kavod? 
Kabod is honor. Why don't we do um, power? In fact, there's a question of whether we say we say a bracha on a president, let's say a sitting U.S. president, a current president. Do you say the bracha, uh, assuming they're, you know, this this shenasan mikvado libiotav? Do we say that blessing on a president? Why wouldn't we say a pre- do Do we say there's something lacking in the presidency because they could be um, they could lose the next election. It's a, a, a dem- is, is democracy a subversion of some, you know, we want totalitarianism. We want a king that, that uh, can't be questioned. I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think, uh, I think a democracy is a form of a, a electing an official to essentially be the equivalent of a king to have that executive privilege with a limited, with, with a, a balance of powers. I think it's a healthy thing. Um, so probably you should make a bracha because by not making a bracha, you're basically perpetuating the stereotype that only a tyrant should be a ruler. Um, and it's important to perpetuate a new type of thing that a ruler doesn't have to be somebody who has absolute power because we know absolute power corrupts. So, um, that's my vote. There are different opinions amongst the poskim. They argue about it and you could either not say the bracha because you could uh, you could say it's a suffix suffix bracha lahaka when we're in doubt when it's a, a bracha we're lenient or you could say the bracha and rely on on the uh, on on the serious poskim that do allow you to say a bracha in this circumstance. Um, there's a lot to say about kings and a lot to say about wise people and the difference between malchi Yisrael and malchi umot olam. But we're going to go on to number four. Um, what's number four? Number four is the story of Rav Sheshes is as follows. He was blind, and Rav Sheshes, again, is a sage who, I believe he went through every all, all of the Talmud, or whatever it is that he could get his hands on of the Talmud every 30 days. And... Um, A bunch of people heard that the king is coming to town, so they went out to greet the king. And amongst them was Rav Sheshis, and another person was at Sadduki. We don't really know who this Sadduki, what does that really mean? We've discussed in other shiurim what, what the Tzaduki may or may not have been. And the Tzaduki already started insulting Rav Sheshis from the get-go, saying things like, a pitcher, you can bring water to the river, I don't know if that means to pour it into the river or take it from the river, but where do broken, presumably to get the, the water from the river, to drink or what, what have you, but where does a broken pitcher go? Meaning you, there's no use for you. So basically, according to this Talmud, the, the Tzaduki was, was picking on him for being impaired by being blind. Uh, before he even argued with him about any religious things or anything like that, and Rav Sheshis kept his cool, and he said, you'll see who knows more, you or I. So challenge accepted, and the troops are coming by, and it got really loud, and the Tzaduki says to Rav Sheshis, the king is coming. Rav Sheshis says he's not coming. Okay, time goes by, a second troop starts passing by, and, it, and the, the, it's thunderously loud, and the Tzaduki says, the king is here. Or king is coming. Rabbi Shesha says, now the king still isn't coming. By this time, much time had passed, and finally a third troop starts coming through. And then all of a sudden it got really quiet. And Rabbi Shesha says, now the king is coming. The Tzuduki says, How, why are you saying that? How would you know that? So he says a statement that I'm going to quote later about how he knows it. And then he quotes the story of Elijah. And in that story of Elijah, in his prophecy, he says the following, And behold, God was passing, and a great powerful wind, smashing mountains and breaking rocks, went before God. God was not in the wind. 
After the wind came an earthquake. God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. God was not in the fire. After the fire came a still, thin sound called Mamadaka. And it was only in that silence or that quietness that God was present. So since the human king has a quality that's like the divine king, that's going to be number um, five to describe that in more detail. Since it's quiet, I know it's the king. And sure enough, it was the king. The king comes and Rav Sheshis makes a blessing on him. The Tzaduki says, how could you make a blessing? You don't even see him. Okay. So, this is a very powerful story. And in this story, On a simple level, you have a question. It's almost like I want to leave out the fact that he was a tzaduki, because that kind of diminishes from the from the importance of the of the parable quality of this story. You have somebody who can see just fine and somebody who's blind. And the person who's saying that he can see is he's he's basically saying there's no comparison. Somebody who can see and somebody who's blind. It's just ridiculous for the for the blind person to even go to a place where the whole idea is to see. There's no there's no purpose in it. It's like going to it's going to a river with a broken pitcher. You, the broken pitcher is of no use to take water from the river. So why are you even here? Anyway. So that's the question. And, and, and these kind of nastinesses persist. You have no, you don't know what's going to, you can't see, there's no purpose, and you're making a blessing on something you don't see. The whole point of Rabbi Sheshis is you, have, you don't know what you're talking about. You see everything and, and don't understand anything. You see and hear noise. You get noise confused with value and importance when maybe it's just the opposite the noise is to generate interest in something that doesn't actually have real value and real things your your eyes see pretty stuff they're distractions to what's what's actually of value so you're missing out so rapacious basically has this inner wisdom and it goes very well with this idea that we before we're talking about ben zoma and chacham arazim this kind of inner understanding and that's what uh, the, the lesson that this is about is sometimes in life, it's not the fancy cars and the flashy suits and the big names that and, and the artificial kind of like, if you see somebody who has like a big following, maybe it's because they're so shallow. So they have like the lowest common denominator. Maybe it's not, it doesn't mean that's the person where I'm going to get wisdom. On the contrary, that's the person where I'm going to get entertained and they're going to take away my time and waste my time with stupidities, right? So, like, if I say, oh, this is the best, this is a show that the most people are watching, probably, it's, it, it, there's a Yiddish saying, the Olam is a Goylam. It's not always true. The Yiddish saying means the masses are fools. Again, the noise represents foolishness, represents people who are, who are making noise, whatever. They think there's a king. There's no king there. There's nothing there. It's just noise. So that's 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 what Reb Sheshers is able to upend the arguments of the Tzaduki because he said, I understand something you don't understand. You're looking at the, su the superficial thing. Why? Because you don't listen. Because you're so busy. You see with your eyes. You don't listen with your intelligence. And Reb Sheshers uh, explains a very important lesson to us to listen internally, not just with the superfici superficiality. Number five is so important it's about this idea about god and his earthly counterpart in the story of abshashas i'll repeat that line of the story i don't think i even said it because i'm keeping it for number five is abshashas answered him how do i know that the king is is here because machusa de ara kein machusa de rakia for the kingship on earth is like a mirror of the kingship of heaven and 
Next story, the continuation of this, is a story with Reb Shila. Reb Shila got in a dispute with a certain person who was acting inappropriately with a certain woman, who he punished because of it, and this person went to the authorities and complained, and the authorities took Reb Shila and said, what exactly, who do you think you are to be able to like give punishment to people without our, we're the, we're the judge and jury here, not you. So, Miracles were happening, and at some point, he said a verse, L'cha Hashem Adula V'agvur Ratiferis, to you God is great in his strength, and they didn't understand what he was saying, what's the meaning of the, what, what, what verse, they didn't understand the language, they said, what exactly are you saying? And he said the following thing, blessed is God who created kingship here on earth which is a reflection of the heavenly kingship and they loved that and they gave him whatever they gave me they gave him authority to judge so let's talk about this concept this concept is the the foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom of sifra kabbalah of the kabbalistic things but interestingly enough, a lot of people think this is Kabbalah. It's not. It doesn't belong in the Talmud. It does. It is in the Talmud. Here it is in the Talmud. Um, that means that when we look at there's a counter there's a counterpart between the the human realm and the divine realm. And in in uh, the tradition of the Baal Shem Tov, when the Magadim is rich and the Baal Shem Tov, they say one of the differences is that Kabbalah made out of God a human and Hasidus made out of a human a God, meaning Kabbalah emphasizes how the spherot that we can anthropomorphize in terms of human dimensions are also a reflection in their divine or reflect are also in the divine origin and and chasidut is is basically explaining how how god is our mirror not not oh, so in kabbalah we say um it made God into a man, like it talked about a God in a way that has ten spherot, and in Chasidut it makes a man into a God because it talks about how what we do affects the divine. The truth is both elements are in Chasidut and both elements are in Kabbalah. The question is how far does this concept that we talk that we say is now in the Talmud? How far does it go in the Talmud? If you look in sections Brachot Daf Yud, for example, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of reciprocity in the in the in the chumash itself there's a lot of reciprocity between us and god so perhaps this thing this thing that's expanded and expounded upon in kabbalah is not really unique to kabbalah it's really in gemara and torah as well thank you